The following is an article from the Reformed Presbyterian, Volume 2, May 1838, entitled, The English Bible. We are indebted to John Wycliffe for the first translation of the entire scriptures into our language. The Romish Church, then in the plentitude of her power and insolence, scowled malignantly upon him as he finished up this precious pearl from the sea of the dead languages. They would have plunged it back again into the depths, but Wycliffe persevered, and they were foiled. A Romish historian, reluctantly, we doubt not, makes the following statement, quote, Wycliffe made a new translation of the Bible, multiplied its copies by the aid of transcribers, and by his poor priests recommended it to the perusal of his hearers. In these hands it became an engine of wonderful power. Men were flattered by an appeal of their private judgment. The new doctrines acquired partisans and protectors in the higher classes who alone were acquainted with the use of its letters. The spirit of inquiry was generated and the seeds were sown of that religious revolution which in little more than a century astonished and convulsed Europe." Unquote. We can see further that the birth of the English Bible was a sorrowful affair to the papists from an early writer who expresses himself thus, quote, that by this means the gospel was made vulgar and laid open more to the common people and even to women who could read than it used to be to the most learned of the clergy and those of the best understanding. And so the gospel jewel, or evangelical pearl, was thrown about and trodden underfoot of swine, unquote. The papists, being good at the business, would have been glad to have burned Wycliffe for his pains. In spite of them, however, he died in quietness in the year A.D. 1384. To show that the flame of their own malice had not ceased, they burned what they could find of him forty years after his burial. The Council of Constance ordered his bones to be dragged out of their sepulchre and committed to the flames, which precious specimen of, potious, uh, of popish magnanimity was presented in the uh, was presented to the world in the year A.D. 1425. Six years after Wycliffe's death, an attempt was made to crush his translation under the mammoth feet of the government. But through the influence of the Duke of Lancaster, a powerful English nobleman, the bills which had been brought into the House of the Lords, uh, in the House of Lords for the his, for this purpose, failed. At a convocation of Roman priests, however, in 1408, it was enacted that, quote, no one should translate any text of scripture into English, and that no publication of this sort, composed in Wycliffe's day or since, should be read in part or in whole, in public or in private, under pain of excommunication, etc. Stealing and Bible reading were enormities of the same class, and to put the perpetrators thereof into the same prison and into the same fire was justice that they only could gainsay who dared deny the infallibility of the Romish Church. This edict gratified the lovers of such matters with many a public execution. At this time, the English Bible was in manuscript only, the art of printing not having been yet discovered, and he must pay well who would become the possessor of a copy. Two hundred of the common copies of our day could be purchased for the money demanded for a single one of Wycliffe's translation. The first press set up in England was in 1474, about 14 years after the discovery of the art of printing. This event was ominous of evil to popery, and abundance of light was shed on the enormities of this work of darkness. We have a curious instance of popish ignorance in the following statement made for the admonition of the faithful, quote, that a certain book called the New Testament had come forth, which was now in everybody's hands, and was full of briars and thorns, unquote. And we find an honest expression of their fear of the press in the declaration of a distinguished prelate, quote, We must root out printing, or printing will root out us, unquote. For the first printed English translation of any portion of the scriptures, we are indebted to William Tyndale, he published the New Testament in Flanders in 1526. The Dutch merchants found the sale profitable, and many thousand copies were soon in circulation. No sooner had they crossed the channel, however, and were found in England, that the Bishop of London set about enlightening his diocese with them by committing as many of them to the flames as he could find. It was wrath, however, that yielded praise, for it gave the book notoriety and vastly increased the circulation. As for Tyndale himself, it was an unpardonable enormity to him to cause the light uh, excuse me, as for Tyndale himself, it was an unpardonable enormity in him to cause the light of the gospel to shine upon the deep moral gloom of England through his mother tongue, and, and accordingly 
Through the influence of the English bishops, he was arrested and imprisoned 18 months, was then strangled at the stake, and his body burned. Cranmer was made Archbishop of Canterbury in 1533. Unlike his friends, he befriended the scriptures and brought to pass a new translation of the whole Bible. Assignments of different portions were made to different individuals for translation. The reply of the Bishop of London is worthy of notice, as showing how completely politeness and liberality of mind may be divorced from ecclesiastical greatness. Quote, I marvel much at what my Lord of Canterbury meaneth, when he thus abuseth the people in giving them liberty to read the scriptures, which doth nothing else than infect them with heresy. I have never bestowed an hour on any portion of them, and never will, and therefore my Lord of Canterbury shall have this shall have his book again, for I never will be guilty of bringing the simple people into error." Unquote. The translation just noticed as instigated by Cranmer was carried through the press by Miles Coverdale, distinguished for piety and learning, and in October of 1535 the whole Bible for the first time was printed in the English language. Coverdale was obliged to fly from the fury of the papists who, eschewing all other modes, sought to illuminate the world by burning Bibles, or men, as they found either most ready at hand. Henry the Eighth was for a while favorable to the circulation of the scriptures, and commanded that his own edict concerning their circulation should be read in the churches. Quote, but herein, says a historian of that day, the waywardness of the priests was observable. They read confusedly the word of God, and the injunctions of the king set forth and commanded to be read by them humming them over so that scarcely any could understand them. They bade their parishioners live as their fathers, and that the old fashion was the best. Notwithstanding, it was wonderful to see that the joy, to see with what joy the book of God was received, not only among the learned, but generally all England over, among all the vulgar and common people, and with what greediness God's word was read, and what resort there was to places where reading of it was enjoyed. Everybody that could bought the book and busily read it, or got others to read it for them if they were not able to read it themselves. The diverse of the old people, excuse me, and diverse of the old people learned to read for the purpose. Unquote. Henry VIII, however, through popish influence, swerved from his former position and interdicted the scriptures by the following edict quote, No women except noble women who might read to themselves alone, nor artificers, apprentices, journeymen, serving men, husbandmen, nor laborers, were to read the Bible or New Testament in English, to himself or to any other, privately or openly, upon pain of one month's imprisonment." Unquote. Under Edward the Sixth, the friends of the Bible again came into favor, and the restrictions respecting its circulation were taken off. In the course of seven years, eleven impressions of the Old and six of the New Testament were taken. Great encouragement was given to its circulation on the accession of, Is uh, of Elizabeth. From 1560 to 1570, there were 17 editions of the Old and six of the New Testament, and by the Queen's command, every church was required to have a copy in some conspicuous place for the perusal of the poor. It is worthy of notice that the papists, finding that the translation and circulation of the Bible with all their good will to the contrary could not be prevented, determined to have one of their own, and it was one so grossly imperfect in various points as to show they would render turbid, if possible, a current they could not prevent. They first published the New Testament in 1584, and the Old with a version of the New in 1609 at Douai, which is the one now used by papists when suffered to use any. The present translation, finished in 1613, has taken precedence, most justly, of all other translations in the English language. And in no language upon the earth can there be found so many copies of the sacred volume or so widely diffused through the world and read by so many people. What was the misty, glimmering morning of the English Bible in 1535 is now the risen day. Its influence on the character and the destinies of the human family must, must be greater, for various reasons, than the same volume in any other language, and the contemplation of the full extent of which will be a delightful theme for those who shall be heirs of salvation. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, 
MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.